George uh, Nolan, in writing of Jesus' interaction with the people of his time, captures this interior disposition of Jesus uh, that I have most desired to possess, this compassion, uh, this gentleness. Nolan says, in his fellow human beings, Jesus saw not sin and guilt, but woundedness, brokenness, sickness, confusion, and fear, and responded with compassion. So the prophet, Gaiac, the, the man of prophecy, um, wanting to do God's will in this situation, this new situation in the here and now, acts as Christ would <coughs> act with compassion toward these, these women. Uh, Ed, many years ago, Edmund Harvey uh, used to say that the word that best summed up uh, Gaiac's life uh, was compassion. And uh, uh, I remember uh, talking with him, you're wasting your time, you don't need to go any further. It's compassion, Kathleen, it's compassion. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> I used to get so mad, I said, you've not read anything yet. <laughs> disposition that, that Gaiac really put on <coughs> when he put on Christ. Compassion and gentleness. And you begin to see it so clearly in aspects of his, of his life. And I think that that attitude toward the women, toward, you don't find him judging. So you never find anything punitive in the refuge. You know, we had no problems uh, that sometimes you, you hear about now in the Madeline places and so on. In Ireland, some sort of punitive attitude toward girls and young women who <coughs> were in that uh, difficulty. But you never hear that about the refuge. It's not to be punitive. They're not being punished as sinners. They're being helped as broken <coughs> women to find, to put their lives back together. Now, it's very interesting. I remember coming upon a letter from Eugène to his father, Eugène Cure to his father. And it's dated, uh, it's soon after 1836 when the Cures came back to Bézier. Apolloni and, and uh, Eugène came back to Bézier in 1837. And uh, Eugène, who was Gaïc's best friend when they were in high school, uh, and probably kept up with him. Uh, guy going to the seminary, Eugene becoming a lawyer and marrying Apollonia and so on. Come back to Bayesian. And uh, Eugene writes to his father. Fa it's Father Gayak, and he usually called him Father when he was talking about him. It's Father Gayak that has the best response to the social needs in Bayesian. And Apolloni and I are going to back him in his works. So they begin to patronize his works in the city of Béziers very early, you know, long before the Round Chapel was built. In, in 1842, when a guy wants to extend the, the refuge and the orphanage, and he says, Providence helped me. Providence, I'm sure, was the cures. Because he was, he was, God was putting his finger on the, the real need of that time in his place of Bézier. And to, to approach it as Jesus would, would have approached it. And he knew that he was doing what was pleasing to the Father in that. He was still in the hospital, by the way. Still in the hospital, but he, he begins to see another need. So the, the prophet, in the sense that we're using it, that call to prophecy, is the one who is attentive to situations in the here and now that are changing, and that Jesus' compassion would have addressed were he alive to, uh, were, were he able to do them except through God, or except through you, or except through me.
there's a beautiful article written by Catherine, Kathleen Coyle, uh, C-O-Y-L-E, uh, in the Eastern, East Asian Pastoral Review. It's called uh, Prophetic Mysticism, The Call to Live Prophetically. It's on the, on the internet. But uh, in describing Jesus' inner journey and our inner journey, she writes, Jesus had an abiding consciousness of being sent by the Father. The Father sends Jesus, who in turn sends us. So the, 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 the prophet has that sense of being sent. Uh, we too, she writes, having been nourished by the divine energy in our mystical side, can reach out and translate the divine energy within us into compassion for those in need and in the here and now to whom we minister. So there, there is a, a, they speak very often of the, the mystical side, the mystical side of the charism as producing sort of a divine energy which then is translated into service, service of compassion in the here and now where there is a need. So there is a very, that's why they, they say the mysticism and the uh, prophecy have to be taken together. Because without the mystical part, the divine energy coming through, we are acting on our own. You know, and we're, particularly if we don't really know whether it's God's will or not, but we see that the paper says this is a need and we're going for it, you know, and we're doing it alone, we're going to, to burn out. But if we have a sense that uh, this divine energy is, is pushing us to continue the mission of Christ in that new situation, there is where the zeal, there is where the continual energy uh, takes place, or where it comes from. Uh, uh, let me give you uh, an example uh, here. Uh, Gaiac, you know, in those days when he was living, most of our apostolate was in education, in the schools. And so here's an example of a, a letter he wrote on the 30th of March, 1884, to a principal in one of our schools, somewhere probably in the middle. And he writes, my dear superior and dear daughters in Jesus Christ, I congratulate you on the success which God, source of all good, has granted you in your schools, as the inspectors have testified. We know how what a wonderful feeling that is. <laughs> I thank God who has willed it to be so and placed you in the great city where you live. I'm confident that this success will serve to inspire in you fresh zeal in carrying out your duties. There is no doubt that you need to apply yourselves in order to be able to give the lessons which are demanded. But it's only the means to win the children and gain confidence in general. As I have already said, Jesus Christ wants to light the fire of love in hearts. So uh, you're, you're there really to, to light the fire of love in those children's hearts. And it's wonderful that you're also educating them uh, and the inspectors are recognizing and so on. But that is the mission of Christ. The mission of Christ was not to educate them. The mission of Christ was to light a fire in their hearts. And uh, then he goes on to say, uh, remember that you are associates of the apostles and that you should be their helpers in the great work of establishing the reign of God. <coughs> So there is that, uh, that, that 
constant refrain, you have to continue the mission of Christ. And the mission of Christ is just one. There are many ministries. That's the, the wonderful breadth that we inherit. Many ministries, but one mission of Christ. That, that they all are collected. And that's the important part. Lighting the fire of love in the hearts of those we work with. Now I'm, I'm moving toward this pulling things together at the end. So I have, uh, if you can think a little bit more time. Now Gayek himself tries to assure us of the connection between the energy, the divine energy within us, and our call to continue the mission and to act with compassion in the here and now. He never mentions the word ministries or prophecies. These are, these are modern terms. But if you're like me, you, uh, you are too, you're only too aware of your weakness uh, that places a block sometimes in the connection between the divine energy that we have from our, our mystical life and the need to respond to a new need in the here and now. Sometimes there's a block. Sometimes uh, we throw ourselves into action relying on our own strength. And we don't wait for the energy to come from the mystical part. And some part, sometimes the mystical part is thriving, but we're afraid to act. I know that that happens uh, that happens in uh, in my life. 